After doing a bunch of tests on this automatic CVT in the previous video, I think it's finally time to put it in a car and give it a try. So let's get started. First off, I had to build a frame to house the CVT, which will also serve as the chassis for the car. Let me just add on some placeholder wheels for a second, so we can get a feel for the size of this. I've now connected the input wheel to a motor, like this, and in a moment, we can connect the output wheel to the rear wheels of the car. But already, you can see what's probably the biggest downside of this automatic transmission design, which is that it is very big, owing to the fact that these two wheels need room to change size in order to automatically vary the gear ratio. And this isn't helped by these quite large assemblies around them to ensure that the hooks reliably latch onto the chain. You can see that I've put the wheels just about as close together as I can without them colliding, and the same goes for the beams at the front and back of the chassis. So this is just about as compact as I could get it lengthwise, and yet even this way, the transmission is taking up literally the entire body of the car. There isn't even room for the motor inside. And it also gives the car next to no ground clearance, even with these big tires. And this brings me to the next problem, which is that unless I want to raise the body even higher off the ground, this is in the way of me connecting a rear axle between the wheels here to drive them. Bear in mind of course that right now the output wheel is at its smallest size, but when the gear ratio increases it will expand all the way to this size, meaning we'd need the rear axle to be all the way down here. To get round this, I thought it would be simple to drive each of the rear wheels independently from each side of the output wheel. Sounds easy enough? The problem though, is that how these wheels are currently designed, the axles sticking out of each side rotate different amounts to vary the wheel size. More importantly though, the automatic effect of this transmission only works if it's this side of the wheel that's connected to the output. As if this half is connected to the output, applying more torque would make the wheel get smaller rather than bigger, causing the gear ratio to decrease rather than increase, which I explained more in my first video on this. So, knowing that it's the left half that has to drive both wheels, I redesigned this section of the wheel. So this right half can just rotate freely, and the axle connected to the left half sticks all the way through it, so we can access it from both sides. However, you can see that this made the design a lot wider on this side. I went through lots of different designs here, but unfortunately this was the only one that let me access the axle freely through the centre, while still having this three-spoked shape. So when it came to connecting this to the wheels, on the left side it was already a pretty tight fit to stick these gears down here to the wheel, because I really didn't want to have to put these gears on the outside of the chassis, as that would have made the whole car way wider. But it was an even bigger squeeze fitting them in on the right side, because of that larger wheel hub piece, which meant that I had to go with this kind of clunky design here, but hey, if it works, it works. Of course, the one downside here is we still can't use a differential between the wheels, which means turning will be a bit harder, but I mean, at the moment, the car doesn't even have steering, so I guess we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. And actually, speaking of that, before I start working on steering, I think this car is already roadworthy enough for us to do a few tests. Starting off with the simplest test, let's just try driving the car up this slope. Also, uh, yeah, I decided yellow wheels fit the colour scheme better, so the car's gonna have yellow wheels from here on. So, driving it up, as you might expect, the CVT automatically switches to a lower gear, and the gear gets even lower the steeper I make the slope, to give the car more torque and let it climb up without putting any more stress on the motor. If I drive the car up this curved slope instead, I think it'll be easier to see the CVT automatically changing its gear ratio. What we're looking for is to see the input wheel getting smaller and the output wheel getting bigger as the slope gets steeper, as this will mean the CVT is giving the rear wheels more torque to deal with the steeper climb. And replaying that in slow motion, we can see that that's exactly what's happening. Now, a pretty interesting use case for an automatic transmission like this is to tow some kind of heavy vehicle, like this trailer I made, which I've loaded up with some weights. When the car tries to tow the trailer, at first, when it has to accelerate it from a dead stop, you can see that the CVT switches right down to the slowest gear, to give the car plenty of torque to accelerate the weight. But then, as the car and the trailer both speed up, and the trailer has more momentum, we can see that the car's CVT slowly changes up and up, until it's back in its fastest gear, and is pulling the trailer at full speed. Now, I'm going to replace the CVT's input wheel, which has been able to shrink to increase the gear ratio, with this fixed one, which fixes the car in its fastest gear, where it's got the lowest torque. For a pretty light weight on the trailer like this, the car still is able to accelerate the weight, 
But look at how it starts off with a big jolt as it tries to get the trailer moving from a dead stop. You can hear that the motor is definitely put under some strain to initially get the weight moving. Compare this to how the motor sounds when I've re-engaged the automatic CVT. Here, the motor is put under a lot less stress, as the CVT eases it in by boosting the car's torque when it's needed the most. And then, as the car and the trailer build up speed, the trailer doesn't need to be accelerated at as fast of a rate anymore, which means the car doesn't need to pull on it with as much force, and, as less force is needed, the CVT automatically changes to a faster gear, which we can see by looking at the input and output discs changing size as the car goes by. Now, back on the version of the car with the fixed transmission, if I increase the weight on the trailer enough, we'll get to a point where the motor simply isn't able to produce enough force to get the weight moving without the help of the automatic transmission. You can definitely hear the motor struggling a bit now, but it looks like it can still handle more weight. <laughs> Still, okay, this motor is a lot stronger than I thought, but I really need to get to a point where the motor stalls to prove my point. Okay, finally, the motor's met its match. So, all of this to show that, now, if I switch back to the automatic transmission, the same motor should, hopefully, now be able to accelerate the trailer up to speed. It's clear the motor's still working pretty hard here, but unlike before, it can speed up the weight from a dead stop. And after a little while, it's able to bring it up to a pretty good speed. Not as fast as if it wasn't towing anything of course, but a lot faster than when it first started off. Also, I think this does a great job of showing just how strong the chain and the arms of this CVT really are, given that they held together when pulling all of this weight. I'd say I was filming this section where the car towed these weights for about 2 hours, and in all that time nothing came loose or fell off. Now, I ended up being able to go through all of those tests without including any steering on this car, but especially given how much of a tight fit it was just to get the CVT itself into a chassis of this size, I thought it would be a fun challenge to see if I could also fit in a steering system before I move on to the next part of the video. And, well, this is what I came up with. I wasn't joking when I said it would be a challenge, mostly because I couldn't pass any linkages directly between the wheels, because the CVT disc is in the way. This meant that I had to weave it round the front of the car like this to stay out of the way of the CVT. And now I can attach a servo motor to the side here to control it. You can see that the wheels can't rotate all that far, which means the car is going to have a pretty huge turning radius, but the thing is, that's limited by the width of the chassis, especially on this side, so the only thing I could have done was to bring the wheels further out, but I really didn't want to make the car even wider. And giving it a drive, yeah, the turning radius isn't great, I won't deny that, and unfortunately it's not helped by the fact that the car can't drive in reverse. Yeah, it can't go in reverse. That's unfortunately just a feature of this CVT design, since the chain needs to be able to slide over these connecting hooks for the wheels to change sides without getting stuck. If I wanted to get round this, I suppose I could add a gearbox after the CVT here that I could use to change the direction from forwards to reverse, but there really wasn't space for something like that on a car of this size. Now, that's just about everything I wanted to test out with this car, so next up, I wanted to try coupling two of these CVTs together. This is getting out of hand. Now there are two of them. When I say coupling them, I mean connecting the output of the first CVT to the input of the second one, and then we'll connect the output of the second one to the wheels of the car. To explain why I want to do this, let me quickly recap how one of these automatic CVTs works. This wheel, which is connected to the input, is being held in its fully opened position by these rubber bands. But, when I apply enough resistive torque to the output, the rubber bands are forced to stretch, causing the input wheel to get smaller, and, because of how the chain pulls on the output wheel, this causes it to get oppositely bigger. And the wheels, changing size like this, causes the gear ratio from the input to the output to go up. 
which increases the output torque while decreasing its speed. By measuring the radii of the input and output wheels at their smallest and largest sizes, we can work out the gear ratios corresponding to the CVT's fastest and slowest gears, which come out to roughly 0.61 in its fastest gear and 1.64 in its slowest gear. However, what's equally important to know is the amount of torque needed to cause this gear ratio change. Since the rubber bands already pre-stretched slightly on these wheels, there will be a certain minimum amount of force that's needed to make them stretch any further, meaning there's a minimum amount of torque we need to apply to the output, below which the CVT will just stay at its lowest gear ratio. From the testing I did in my previous video, I found that this minimum torque that's needed to initiate any gear change was about 1.5 newton centimeters. And then, by the same token, once we apply enough torque, the input wheel will get to its smallest size, at which point, no matter how much more torque we apply, the CVT's gear ratio won't go up any higher. And from that testing, I found that this maximum torque value was about 4 newton centimeters. Now, by coupling two of these CVTs together, the most obvious benefit we get is that, since we multiply the gear ratios at each stage, the lowest gear ratio gets much lower, and the highest gear ratio gets much higher. So, we've now got a much wider range of gear ratios. However, a more subtle change is that the minimum torque to change gear gets lower. It actually gets lower because it gets multiplied by the lowest gear ratio of the second CVT. And, likewise, the maximum torque gets higher, as it gets multiplied by the highest gear ratio of the second CVT. So, we can get a wider range of gear ratios in response to a wider range of torques. Why does this happen? Well, for low output torques, the gear ratio of the second CVT is less than 1, so it increases speed and reduces torque. This means that the torque that we apply to the output axle is felt to increase on the second CVT's input which is the first CVT's output. So, the first CVT is actually experiencing a higher torque than what we're applying to the output, which results in it starting to change gear at a lower torque than it did when we only had a single CVT. But then, once we apply more torque and the second CVT also starts changing its gear ratio, its gear ratio will eventually go above 1, after which point the first CVT will now be experiencing less torque than what we're applying to the output. So, we'll also have to apply more torque than we would have on one of these, in order for both CVTs to reach their highest gear ratios. If I play this in slow motion, you can see that the wheels of the first CVT start changing size first, and then the wheels of the second CVT start changing, and change all the way. And then, it's actually the first CVT that's last to change all the way down. So, how does this help us? Well, comparing this coupled CVT to the single one, for low loads, we'll be able to drive at a higher speed, thanks to the coupled CVT's lower gear ratio for low torques. And for high loads, the car will have access to higher torques than it did before, without putting higher stress on the motor. In the tests we did with the single CVT, the car could go at a good speed, but it struggled a bit to pull the heaviest trailer. So, if we were to gear down the output of the coupled CVT a bit, so as to match its lowest gear ratio with that of the single CVT, the car will still be able to drive at the same speed for low loads, but, when in its lowest gears, will have way more torque to deal with the heavy load on the trailer. Putting this transmission in a car wasn't the easiest job though. I put the two CVTs side by side in the chassis to save space. So, the motor will power this wheel, which drives the output of the first stage here. This then connects into the input of the second stage, which drives the output wheel here. This was where the problem started, because now I somehow had to drive both rear wheels with this. I couldn't bring a shaft round this wheel without making the car way bigger, so I had to get the shaft through it instead. So if I take off this wheel, you can see that it can rotate completely independently of the axle running through its centre. But, since this is the wheel that the motor has to power, I had to drive this whole wheel via this turntable piece, so I could still get the axle through it to drive the right side rear wheel. So, with it back on, you can see that one continuous shaft passes all the way through here to drive both rear wheels, while the input CVT wheel can be driven from this side here. And, like I mentioned before, I picked this gear ratio on the output specifically, to match the overall gear ratio that the first CVT had when its transmission was in its lowest gear. And, with that gear ratio, we can see that both cars drive roughly at the same speed. But, when the car tries to pull the heaviest trailer, the motor now struggles way less than it did before, 
thanks to the CVT being able to switch to a much higher gear ratio. Now, the beauty of this coupled CVT is that, let's say I was happy with the maximum torque that the first car could provide, but I wanted it to be faster when driving freely. In that case, instead of gearing down the coupled CVT's output to increase the car's maximum torque while maintaining its no load speed, we can gear up the output to increase its speed when driving freely while maintaining its same maximal torque as before. To do that, I just need to switch out the gear ratio on the car's rear axle to this one. Bear in mind of course that when I say gearing up the output, I mean gearing it up compared to the gearing used on the first car, but you can see that in an absolute sense we're still gearing down the output, just by less than before. And now we can see that it drives faster than our first car did, while still just about being able to accelerate the heavy trailer. However, it actually hasn't sped up by as much as we'd expect based on the numbers I showed before. And the reason is that, if you look closely, you can see that the input wheels on the CVTs have already shrunk slightly below their maximum size, meaning the car, just moving its own weight, has already changed down to a slightly lower gear to give itself more torque. This is unfortunately the downside of trying to gear the automatic CVT for more speed, as it means the minimum resistive torque that causes it to start changing gear decreases. Here, we haven't increased the speed that much, so it's not too noticeable of an issue, but if we geared it up much further, then that top end speed would essentially just be wasted on this car, as it will never encounter low enough resistance to actually be willing to change to those higher speeds. The solution to this could be to use stronger rubber bands to hold the wheels open, so they're not so fast to change up to a higher gear ratio, but if they're not changing gear as easily, the motor will have to provide more torque when the output torque increases, so it will be put under more stress. Just something to think about. But anyway, that's just about all the testing I wanted to do with this automatic, continuously variable transmission. I know the past few videos have all been focused on this, but it's just because there's been so much I've wanted to do with it. But now, I think it's time to change gears a bit, you could say. So in the next video, I'll be working on something pretty different. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you then.